today. Isn't God's grace just amazing and extraordinary and wonderful today? We're going to talk about that. I'm Amy Schaefer. I'm here with Tom and Angela. Tom, we have a great... I wonder how many times we're going to say amazing and grace, and grace this today. entire program. But we all know the song, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. Mm -hmm. A wretch like me? Yeah, we'll talk about that too. <laughs> but do you know the story of its author? Two guests are with us today, Bruce Hindmarsh and Craig Borlase, who share the incredible story of John Newton, a slave trader who found Amazing Grace and wrote the song, but to also share some profound spiritual truths for knowing and applying God's amazing grace in our world today. That's the key, guys. I mean, I loved this book, and I love, the, you know, I love history, I love the story, but how do we apply the lessons from that life today? Yeah, I think we're going to find some surprising truths out from these guys about this story that has really created our popular culture, even within American society and abroad. When people think of Christianity, they think of this song. Mm -hmm. This song rolls deep with me because, you know, growing up, I, I was raised up to sing in church and, and I w went to school for, you know, musical theater. And anyway, I ended up singing Sandy Patty's version of Amazing Grace. So if you're of the older generation, I'm not saying I'm old, but if you're, you'll remember that song and the layers and the depths of the richness of the high notes and the low notes and the words. And, and you're, you're looking back at the faithfulness of God and then you're looking forward uh, what's to come. And it's, I mean, no matter where you sang that song, anywhere in the world, Something happens in the atmosphere. The words, it is obviously, it was anointed and called by God to be written. You know, I, I, just some of the interesting things. I mean, it's been called the, the anthem of, 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 of heaven, you know, but uh, uh, Bruce sent us some interesting facts about it. And one of them is that the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. has over 3,000 recordings yeah. uh, from various artists from 1930 all the way up until the present day of Amazing Grace. That's the, the, the incredible breadth and power that it has. Yeah, it's far reaching. Yeah. I know I need Amazing Grace. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be talking about that. Well, as we've been talking about, most of us are familiar with the classic hymn Amazing Grace, but the story of the song's author, John Newton, is quite surprising, even shocking. It is really shocking. Joining us now are authors Bruce Hindmarsh and Craig Borlase, and in their new book, Amazing Grace, they share about the life of John Newton and the surprising story behind his favorite, the famous song. Bruce and Craig, welcome to Hope Today. Thank you. Good to be with you. Well, let me Thanks. Start. It's lovely to be here. And, and by the way, this is the furthest we've had two guests uh, at the same time, <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, we've got Bruce here in Vancouver. And Craig, where exactly are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm just in uh, south of Oxford in England. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, Bruce, I'll start with you. Why, uh, I mean, again, we all have been blessed by the song, anyone who's been around the church for very long or has heard the song, but why study the life of John Newton? There's some amazing, again, I'm using the word, incredible things of, about his life. Why study his life? I think, I think there's a few reasons. One is um, it's a big anniversary. It's the 250 year anniversary of Amazing Grace. As you've been saying, is there any song uh, more well known in the world, uh, worldwide, than Amazing Grace? And people maybe know the song, but don't know the story behind the song. And the story is compelling. It's uh, what Newton, if anybody had been through many dangers, toils, and snares, it was John Newton. And knowing the story behind his song brings out a kind of richness uh, to the, the hymn but also it's a redemptive story. And I think Craig and I felt like at a time when our society is so divided, it, uh, I mean, the need for grace is universal, but it feels like right now is a moment to, to retell this story and to be reminded that the need for grace is universal and, it is, uh, and it's available, that God's grace is amazing, and to try to tell that for another generation. You know, I think one of the things I want to put out on the table right away is that word wretch, who saved a wretch like me. And I uh, have a little story. My, my aunt was sharing with me that a, a, per, a, a lady from her church said, why does it say wretch? God doesn't make wretches. So what, what would you say to that? Uh, why the word wretch and why is that 
uh, so pertinent to the story? Mm. Do you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, there are some people who are embarrassed by that word in the early 20th century, and they uh, took it out of some of the revisions and said, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved and strengthened me, or amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved someone like me. And, uh, and yet, when life is inconsolable, when the very worst things happen, uh, people want to sing this hymn. They realize that life has a wretchedness, and it's part of being honest, that there, there are times when we just can't make sense of life, when suffering rips across our lives, and the, the, the human condition, it's universal. Sooner or later, we encounter the way that life's not the way it's supposed to be. And um, so there, uh, it's interesting that, that even the secular 20th century, 21st century uses of this song in popular culture and times of sorrow, they, they, they want to use the word wretch. There's a, there's a recognition after a school shooting, after the space shuttle Challenger disaster, after 9-11, when people gather and sing this song. They, 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 we want to be honest that life can sometimes be inconsolable and we stand in need of mercy and grace. Uh, you know, as we study the life of John Newton, there's so many things that, are, that offend our modern day sensibilities, but he's not shy about his faults and about sharing his faults in his own writings. Craig, wh why do you think that is and why, why were you all not shy about sharing his faults? Well, I think, Tom, for me, um, when I first uh, met with Bruce and we talked about doing a book, my initial reaction was like, this probably isn't going to be a very exciting book. I mean, who wants to really write and read a book about a song that's 250 years old? It didn't seem to have much to it. But, you know, you pick out that word wretch, and I think that's really, really key. I think when we look at stories, I mean, when we look at true stories, we're interested a lot more in in the ones that are full of the grit and the dirt um, and, and the, redemption, the redemptive arc, ultimately, than in just, you know, success without any um, without any trial. And I think that, for us telling the story in this way, focusing actually quite a lot on his early years, focusing on the stuff which perhaps is slightly uncomfortable, which you might want to sweep under the carpet, but that ultimately I think makes it a more impactful and more encouraging story. So Craig, can you tell us the story behind the author? Tell us what happened in his life that as he's looking back at all of the toils and the snares, what were those toils and snares and troubles that he went through? Well, first of all, I've got to defer to Bruce because Bruce is the brains behind this project. I just do the, the fluff, okay? okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna get it wrong now. But um, you know what, the things which really stand out is that Newton's story, um, while it's old and it belongs to a very, very different era, there are some really, um, common themes you know he was um he made some classic mistakes you know he fell in love with a girl and he was dumb you know he he messed up his career prospects because of this girl um he was um rude and he was often tried to be very humorous and it backfired um he got himself in all kinds of trouble and then things kind of spiraled and spiraled and spiraled and he eventually ended up having what I think we just have to describe as a real breakdown. Um, life was really, it was hard, you know. He, he ended up in a very, very difficult position. But it was out of that that he, um, he was pulled. And it's a long, long, long journey then from that place of um, his kind of early redemption, of, of rescue, until he starts to really kind of get what it means to be saved by God. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's, it's distant and it's old, but, you know, it's really, I think it's still really, really relevant. Bruce, did you want to respond to that as well? Craig said he needed to default to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think as we um, were telling the story, we, we wanted it to be a kind of parable. In a sense, we can all find ourselves in this story, realizing that we need grace because of things that have happened to us sometimes. Sometimes awful things that happen to us, but also because of the things that we have done. And in Newton's story, I mean, there is trauma, you know, um, at, at six years of age, losing his mother, probably something like tuberculosis. His father is away, family tensions, doesn't really feel like he fits in his family. There's kidnapping. 
There is, he is abused uh, alone, far away from home. There is near-death uh, shipwreck. There's near-death starvation. There is uh, near-death illness. There's, um, he is enslaved himself, and then he becomes a slave trader. Uh, but by the end, you, you, you watch this transformation happening slowly. You know, grace wasn't one and done. It wasn't just sort of some, you know, all of a sudden he's different. Very much, very different than that. He himself said it was a slow way that grace kind of went to work in his life. But you see a transformed man, a powerful preacher, uh, a spiritual counselor to, to, to thousands. And then in the end, a courageous abolitionist who seeks to destroy the system that he had been a part of and who is willing to speak out. For me, that was some of the most moving part of the book as we uh, returned to the story, as we wrote some of the things towards the end of his life, where in his 60s, he has to reckon with some of what he had done in his 20s. And he needs to be honest about it. And he needs to speak out publicly and take a certain kind of shame on himself and to really make efforts to try to destroy the system that he had been, um, had been a part of. I love that you all are choosing to tell this story now, and I really believe that through the song Amazing Grace, we're beginning to understand more of God's amazing grace even demonstrated in his life. Within our cancel culture mindset, what is it that you hope we as readers can glean from the very life of John Newton and through this amazing grace he describes? I think we tried to write this story in a way that went between, um, you know, it's neither raising a statue nor is it toppling a statue. It's neither cancel culture nor whitewashing, because as a Christians we have, as Christians we have an obligation to be honest to tell the story as truthfully as we possibly can, and and that's all you need to do is to tell the story truthfully, and I think it 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 speaks to the fact that we are all um, in Adam. Uh, we are all in Christ, is that we universally stand in need of grace. That, that, that need is, is, is universal. And I think that's something we need to hear today. I keep thinking of that verse in the book of Hebrews that says, the sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, is uh, the recognition that this song written by a former slave trader has become an African-American spiritual. It speaks to the fact that this need for grace is universal and it speaks a deeper word than simply recrimination and, and a kind of polarization that we see so often in the world today. Well, let, let me ask you both, and Craig, I'll start with you. What line, word, or part of the song speaks to you? Um, I mean, it just is, it's, it's the line of the wretch, you know, that's the thing. That, so right from the very start, when I finally got over myself and realized, no, this, this is a really good story and this could make a really good book. In my mind, I just kept thinking the, the title is Wretch. You know, it would be a terrible title for a book, but in my mind, that's what it was. It was always called Wretch. Um, mm. And there's something just very comforting. And, you know, I told you Bruce of the Brains, you know, his last answer, he just says it so well, you know, there, whatever this book, I think, leads people to, it could be many, many different things. Uh, I don't think we can prescribe one specific thing that we want readers to take away. Um, but hopefully by people sharing the experience, entering into it, seeing, you know, um, Newton's experiences and his um, his ups and downs through his own eyes, feeling them a little bit for themselves, then I'm, I'm sure God's going to speak to them in that way. Bruce? Yeah. Um, I think this is one of Craig's gifts as a writer. He's uh, he's an amazing wordsmith, an amazing writer, but he can see the he can see the story and some of the universality of this, and um, and the way in which we can find ourselves in this story, and uh, there is no depth too low that God's grace can't reach, you know, and um, but to also to reckon with the ways in which we can be self deceived. And that's part of Newton's story is there was uh, he received God's grace. He began to respond to God's mercy, but it took time for him to to realize the iniquity of the slave system that he had been involved in. And uh, but God's grace continued to work in his life. He said later in life, um, uh, uh, custom, example and interest had blinded my eyes. 
And just think of what it's like when uh, everybody accepts it as customary. Uh, people I respect uh, are involved and, and assume that this is okay. Example, and interest, self-interest. And it took to see the, that's a powerful chain that had to be broken to see that, um, that all of this self-interest and that whole slave system needed to be demolished. And that to watch that happen over time in his life, I think, is, uh, is a very moving lesson. We can be self-deceived, but we can become undeceived. We can make amends. We can let God's grace change us over our lifespan and, uh, and make us more like Christ. Bruce and Craig, as I see you on the screen together, it's like I almost see a picture of amazing grace. And I'm thinking about how did it come together that you gentlemen from across the pond, across the ocean in two different parts of the world are coming together to talk about the grace of God. Can you share just a little bit of that story? Yeah, shall I jump in with this one? Yeah, go ahead. It was our dear friend, um, Charles Morris, who's the kind of guy who, when he phones you or when he emails you, you think, oh, something's coming through here. This, uh, <laughs> this is going to be a request. We're going to brace for impact. And, um, but he's got a great heart and he's got great instincts. And um, I've had the privilege of traveling to Iraq with Charles before, to Cuba, um, he has like the most amazing instincts for sniffing out what God's doing. Um, and normally it's current. Um, but in this case, it was thinking that actually we need to celebrate. We need to mark the anniversary, the 250th anniversary of the writing of Amazing Grace. So he's a mutual friend. And um, that's how we got together. So let me, let me ask you uh, just to follow up on that. How does this work when two people write a book? I don't <laughs> understand. I mean, how, how exactly do... Does uh, somebody write one chapter? Or write, I mean, how, how, do, how do the mechanics of that work? We spent some time together in Vancouver, and uh, Craig uh, flew over, and we kind of storyboarded together and, and worked together. It helps, uh, Tom, that we were t eight hours apart. We can kind of work in shifts a little bit back and forth. And, um, <laughs> and um, uh, the, the metaphor we ended up using is, uh, I, you know, I would kind of sous chef. And then, uh, you know, in the evening in Vancouver and uh, send something to, to Craig and then he would cook all day and make something beautiful in the kitchen and then send it back to me and I could adjust the recipe a little bit and uh, sort of on we went. Wow. That probably gives uh, too much credit to me. It's really Craig that is the, um, you know, the writer who captured the story and, and the beauty of it. Uh, but we kind of cooked back and forth uh, eight hours apart. Well, that, that, that was another metaphor as well. The other metaphor was that I was the Labrador and Bruce had the whistle. So I could just <laughs> run around. And when I, got, when I got lost or when I was sniffing something I shouldn't have been sniffing, Bruce would blow the whistle and then pull me back. <laughs> I love well, that. Uh, well it, it comes across, and again, I highly recommend this book. I devoured it. I loved it. I read it all in the last two days here. But let me just ask you one, one quick thing, and I'll, I'll ask you, Bruce. Somebody watching. You know, maybe they're slightly interested in the story, but they have their own things they're struggling with, their own maybe sins that are haunting them or difficulties that they've been through. What would you say is the, is the final word to them? What's the word that, that would minister to them today? Oh, that's good. Tom, I think if there's anybody who feels like you're, you're ready to give up and you feel like perhaps it's too late for me, or um, what I've done is too awful, or God's grace uh, might be there for other people, but not for me. I think this is the story for you. I think this is the story that can, that can really make a difference, that if God could forgive uh, John Newton, and if God, John Newton could find grace and God's grace could change him, then I think God's grace can reach anybody. And in the end, uh, Craig and I have often said, uh, we didn't title the book, Amazing John Newton. Uh, it's Amazing Grace. And it's just, it's a parable that reminds us that God's grace is deep enough. Uh, we could all use God's grace and there's nobody who's beyond um, uh, God's grace. Well, Bruce and Craig, thank you so much. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for joining us in, in, your, in your two locations. And uh, uh, again, I highly recommend the book, Amazing Grace. And when we come back, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, 
we're going to share a couple of verses of Amazing Grace, and we're going to just see what God has to say to us today, this day. We'll be right back. Cornerstone Television has believed in the power of prayer since its inception 44 years ago. We invest heavily in our prayer line to provide you with 24-7 personal prayer, knowing it brings breakthrough, healing, and wisdom. Last year alone, we received over 65,000 prayer calls. And if you have partnered with us, thank you so very much. And when you give this month, I am so excited to share with you my new book, Praying on Another Level. It's a 30-day journal to take your prayer life to a new dimension in God. You see, prayer is how we separate good ideas from God ideas. It's how we unlock the door to revelation, and it's where we get our strength to build up our spirit man to hear from God throughout our day. All that and so much more. So call us now at 888-665-4483 or give at ctvn.org forward slash donate to request your copy. It is time to take your prayer life to another level. Today, we're going to take a little bit of time to reflect on verses 1 and 2 found in that very popular song we've just been discussing, Amazing Grace. It goes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Reading that, it's hard not to sing the song that we all hear. I'm like, just read it, don't sing it, you know. But it is, it's such a beautiful testimony. And as the gentleman shared about the story of John Newton, what really struck me about this song and his life is that it was a slow burn of accessing God's grace and recognizing what it meant for him and how he could be more of an extension of God's grace. And for me, Amy, I feel like this song and this story challenges me to say, okay, God, where are the spaces in me that I need to explain and, and, and demonstrate out more of God's grace because I've received so much of it? Oh, man. A wretch, right? Who saved a wretch, like basically a sinner, basically somebody lost doing their own thing. Thank God that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Thank God for his amazing grace. No person is too far gone, too far wretched. You know, and even in these lyrics, um, I was blind, but now I see. Yeah. And I think about the Apostle Paul, what he taught us to pray that the eyes of our heart would be flooded with light, yes. that these blinders would come off of our eyes. Mm -hmm. I once couldn't see Christ, but now I can. Mm -hmm. I once didn't understand the Bible, but now I see. Once I couldn't open the word, I didn't crave it, but now I see. So there is something tangible, Tom, that takes place um, as a follower of Christ or when you're coming to Christ that you didn't see and then all of a sudden, I mean, what's that threshold where I don't see, but now I see. And once you see, you can't unsee. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're praying for you today, that, that you'll come to know and experience for yourself the amazing grace of God. And once you've seen, you'll never go back yeah. in Jesus' name. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think of a guest we had on earlier who said when they came to Christ, they came to Christ at age 30, and when they came to Christ, it was like, the colors were brighter, the trees were greener, the sky was bluer. And it, it, it just, it, we do see differently. Uh, but you know, guys, uh, uh, the second verse always spoke to me. It's grace that, it was grace that taught my heart to fear yeah. and grace my fears relieved. Isn't it interesting? Uh -huh. The two uses of the word fear. Yes. And I, I thought of my dad, I had a great dad. And whenever dad was around as, your, as a little kid, my fears are relieved. You know, you get scared at night or something. You hear dad's voice. All of a sudden, your fears are relieved. But it also taught my heart. Dad taught my heart to fear. Okay? <laughs> if I was doing wrong, uh, the fear of God came upon me when dad came in the room. Okay? And that, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And John Newton, he felt that. He felt that the, the, the wretchedness of his previous life, the, being a slave trader, 
And, you know, one thing I didn't know until I read this book is that it wasn't like he was a slave trader way in the back. He got saved. The Spirit of God came in and he quit slave trade. No, it was a process. He was still slave trading as a Christian. And we, we say, well, how could that possibly be? Again, he, was, he talked about he was subject to the, 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 the conventions of the times, you know, and the practices of the times. And, uh, but God had his way eventually, and it taught his heart to fear doing the wrong things and to have comfort in having his fears relieved. That's always spoken to me. Yeah, and I think that's the point of it, is that even as a believer, if you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I know that I'm wretched. I know that it was by God's amazing grace that I was saved. It's an invitation to cry out and ask God, Lord, let my blinded spots in my life be open. Any hatred or malice or, or anger that I have towards people or, or customs that I've gotten comfortable in that are not your way, God, change me. There's always more of Jesus that we can experience and that we can extend into the world. So true. And you know, this isn't just about, this song isn't just about looking back and thinking about your sin and thinking about what a wretch you were and, and reminiscing. But this song also brings you into um, when we've been there, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun. Heaven is real, eternity is real, God's grace is amazing, His love is fantastic. It's hard to even put into words. So I just want to ask you, are you walking with God today? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? This is the bottom line. This is. This is honestly all that matters in life. This is the only thing that matters. Well, I'm so busy. I've got, I've got to do laundry, dishes, kids, school, work, blah, blah, blah. The only thing that matters is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And once you've met him, you have met amazing grace. And that brings hope today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, Explore 30 amazing descriptions of who Jesus is and what he is focused on. International evangelist Dr. Steve Foss examines who Jesus is as presented in the book of Revelation that will help you gain a more deep and intimate knowledge of Jesus' character, nature, and authority. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.